Okay, today we are function tonight. We focus on the, <coughs> excuse me, the teleomycetes. Teleomycetes today, this is a very large parasitic group of Basidiomycota, and it includes the rusts and the smuts. So these are very serious disease-causing organisms. Diseases not of humans, but of <coughs> diseases of crops especially. So they're important to us because they are important crop diseases. These cells of the teleomycetes have perforated septa. But there is no dolopore septum. You remember the dolopore septum has that thickening, so the cell walls have that little thickening at the end. And there's that cap, the parenthesome around them. So there is no dolopore septum. In these. So there really is a hole in the cell wall. And that hole in the cell wall is going to be very important because in this group, <clears throat> as we've seen in other groups, we're actually going to get the migration of nuclei. And it's going to be a very important in the sexual reproduction. The nuclei are going to move through that hole at, a por at some portion of the life cycle. The chief characteristics of the teleomycetes is the <clears throat> teleospore. This is a thick-walled spore resting and if you recall it looks something like this. It's got a little constriction at the center and the cell wall is very thick. And out of that teleospore, <clears throat> we have the teleobasidium growing. So the teleobasidium has got those four teleospores growing out of it. My voice is just not going to work at all. Four basidiospores growing out of it, and that's the teleobasidium. <clears throat> so that's characteristic of this group, the teleomycetes, the teleospore and the teleobasidium. Well, you know, it doesn't, gets a little hard to define exactly here. We could, I've tried to draw really the teleobasidium in blue there, but it comes out of the teleospore, so I'm sure that there is some textbook that says the teleospore is part of the teleobasidium. So. You're never going to be asked to differentiate those kind, that kind of detail. Here's the life cycle. Life cycle is very complex. In fact, it's the most complex life cycle we're ever going to do in this class. Let's start by finding our basic processes in this life cycle. And we know that there are three of them. There's meiosis, plasmogamy, and karyogamy. Now, plasmogamy and karyogamy are going to occur just before the basidium forms. So they're going to be very close together. And in fact, we can see here's karyogamy. And here, although you can't see it, is meiosis. I said plasmogamy occurs. Plasmogamy does not occur at the same point. Plasmogamy occurs way over here. It's coming back. Thank you. <clears throat> plasmogamy is going to occur over in this part. Hmm. 
Let me change my color so you can see that. So we can draw our three lines, plasmogamy, karyogamy, and meiosis. That means we have, between plasmogamy and karyogamy, dikaryotic, dikaryotic phase. Between karyogamy and meiosis, the diploid phase, and between meiosis and plasmogamy, the haploid phase. Now, perhaps you've also noticed that there are two different kinds of higher plants drawn on the same page. So we have over here, on this side, we have one of those plants, and this is wheat. This is a parasite of wheat. Wheat is the genus Triticum, and the species of breadweed is Aceticum. On the other side, we have another plant. Doesn't look at all like wheat. And this is the alternative host. When it's not growing on wheat, this grows on barberry. And that is Berberis vulgaris. Most common one is Berberis vulgaris, which is a European barbarian, introduced plant. So there are two hosts, and we say that then that this organism has two hosts, which means that it is, or the technical term is hetero heteroecious, two houses. And you know those roots, hetero, different, ecious, home or house. So it's got two plants that it grows on. It's heteroecious, going part of its life cycle on barberry and part of its life cycle on wheat. And that's extremely important for the control of these plants, meaning the control of the fungus. So in fact, the most effective method of controlling this is not with a fungicide, but with the, by disrupting its life cycle. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important to learn about life cycles of plants is because when you want to take and you want to intervene to do something to improve crop health of these parasitic, when we've got a parasite like this, or um, an invasive plant, you want to do something to disrupt its growth. It's often important to know the life cycle so that you can take an intervention that is appropriate to that plant. We'll come back to that when we talk about what was done to help reduce the effect of, <clears throat> of this parasite on, the, on wheat farming. And it was a huge, huge problem in the Midwest. I'll show you how, how bad it was as we go along before we talk about the remedies. So again, knowing that it's heteroecious is going to be very important. We're going to use that to intervene in its life cycle. We're going to go through all of those parts of the life cycle in quite a bit of detail. So here we're just reminding you that there's a host. The barberry is up here as one host, and that is all, most all in the haploid life period of the life cycle. So most of this, and it's exactly, it's a little hard to tell you exactly where that, haploid stage ends because of how this drawing is done, but up until the infection of the barberry leaf, this plant is in the haploid stage. So here's our basidia spores. And they're going to land on the barberry leaf and grow into that leaf with our haploid primary mycelium.
Here's Barberry. No, <clears throat> no, it's not close to the <coughs> It's growing along a fence row. So a fence row would separate fields. And what do you think this is over here? Wheat. Wheat. So it's really, <clears throat> this barberry was grown as a windbreak between wheat fields. And a windbreak has a very important function is that a very common, not a disease, but a, a common problem with the grains, growing the grains, is that is called lodging. And lodging occurs when a wind comes through and it pushes all the grains over and you can't harvest it because the stalks aren't standing up. So lodging is an incredibly um, destructive, wind is incredibly destructive. And so the way that people got around wind, farmers got around wind, was they would build wind breaks. And unfortunately, for the life cycle of our pest, I haven't told you the name of this organism yet, Puccinia glimenis tritici, it's called, before its life cycle was known, barberry was used as the windbreak. And so it was perfect for this pest. It would grow on wheat for part of its life cycle, shed the spores to barberry, and reinfect the wheat. So that is one reason why it was such a big problem. And it also suggests a solution. Part of the solution, of course, was getting rid of that barberry. Here's the plant, the common barberry. This is the alternative host for it. It's also got lots of spines on here, so it's a very interesting plant. Um, historically, you know, this plant was grown around campus a lot. <clears throat> it wasn't grown, <clears throat> it's not grown very much now. There's only a very few plants around campus and quite hard to find. In little corners have survived. But back when I came to campus in the um, late 80s, that <clears throat> Over next to um, ACOP Auditorium, you know, there's those hills. And that barberry was all planted over there. And the history of why barberry was on those hills is very interesting. I'll just take a second to tell you about this plant because, you know, in the 60s, there was nice grassy knolls there right under, bar and you know what students might have done in the 60s. <laughs> things, And the administration was not interested in having them do that right out in front of everybody on these grassy knolls. And so they took, they planted barberry with all those huge spines around. And those persisted up until the 80s when they eventually, the only place for a long time, the only place that it survived on campus was in back, you know, there's a, a daycare across the street, things, and there's a fence around the back of the daycare. And right around the back of that fence, on the other side of the fence, they planted barberry. So, you know, the little kids, if they were running toward that fence, they would just, they got through the fence, they'd get the barberry. So <laughs> eventually they, they did get rid of it there too. <clears throat> there is a little bit back of nursing, still one of the few places on campus. So alternative histories of UNCG with barberry. <clears throat> but also a very important plant for the alternative host. So here it is, the basidiospores landing on producing the primary mycelium on barberry. <clears throat> and then on the upper part of that leaf, and we'll show you an enlargement of a picture of this now, we are going to get the primary mycelium producing the sex organs. And those organs are Receptive hyphae, receptive hyphae, hyphae, and spermogonium, spermogonia. So the receptive hyphae, remember the trichogyne, we just remembered that from our quiz. A trichogyne occurs on the ascogonium. Now we've just lost the ascogonium. There's no multinucleate structure there, and all we have are hyphae that are going to stick up, receptive hyphae that are going to come up from that mass of cells that I've got the arrow to. That mass of cells, that's the spermogonia, and it's going to produce spermatia. 
So they're unicellular and they have no flagella. So we can't call them sperm, but they function kind of like sperm. They're going to fuse with the receptive hyphae. Here they are. These are the spermatogonia. This is on the barberry leaf. Now the spermatogonia look differently in different, different versions or different races of the of the of the um, organism. I got to write that Persinia gruminis on the board here. Here's another picture of a different variety of spermatogonia. And this is Puccinia. It's the genus, Graminus, <coughs> meaning that it's a parasite of grasses. And now we're going to use a third name here, Tritiche, to indicate that this race that we're talking about, this race of Puccinia Graminus that we're talking about, is a parasite of wheat. So it's a specialist on wheat. There are other ones that specialize on oats, on the other grains. So there are different races of Puccinia gruminis that specialize on the different grains. So, gruminis grass, Puccinia of the grasses, and then which grass? Triticum. Hmm. I have a better slide than that that somehow didn't get in. This is the upper surface of the leaf. And again, we're looking at the spermagonium. And there are receptive hyphae. And you can see that here are the spermatia. And the spermatia are being shed into this, it's shown kind of here, hashed. This is a sweet li liquid. So there's <clears throat> shed into this fluid that is secreted by the spermatogonium, and that attracts insects, which will then pick up the spermatia and carry them over to another part of the leaf, perhaps they're just walking around on the leaf, carrying over to other parts, and that's where they're transferred then, or they can be transferred to the receptive hyphae. So that process is kind of like what happens when we have pollen transferred from the higher plants from one flower to another flower. That process is called pollination. This process is called spermatization. Now I'm saying the transfer of spermatia from one, what is that thing that we're going to call that? Well, it's spermatogonium, we can call it. But the spermatogonium, there's another term we can use for that or that's sometimes used for that. You remember that there are these structures that we see in the parasitic ascomycota, for instance, and they produce spores, canidia spores sometimes, and that whole thing then is called the pycnidium. So I only mention that because we've learned pycnidia in other organisms. It is not the most common term for the spermatogonium but you will find textbooks that call what we're calling spermatogonium the pycnidia. And you see it looks really almost exactly like a pycnidium. And in the next picture, you'll see that it, there's, the resemblance is really remarkable. It's 
spermatogonium or pycnidium. So these would then be the receptive hyphae. And we can't see the spermatogonia here. The barberry, this is all barberry cell. the barberry. So the hyphae, the primary mycelium, is growing through that barberry tissue and producing our spermatogonia. It's in the spermatogonia then that we get plasmogamy. And there it is. We've been talking about it, just haven't mentioned it. <coughs> so plasmogamy occurs there. Now, something else is going on in the lower part of the leaf. At the same time, as plasmogamy is taking place on the top, on the bottom part of the leaf, we have the primary mycelium Forms, forming these clumps of cells that are going to produce spores. And when they start producing spores, they are going to be called acea. Aceol, here the adjectival form. Acea means uh, an injury. <coughs> So they're going to form acial primordia. You know, the word primordia means beginning, first beginnings, primordial. <clears throat> so the beginnings of the acea. These acial primordia are haploid. So the cells in it are all haploid at this stage. Now, something really cool and amazing is about to happen. After plasmogamy, we get dikaryotic cells. And there's two ways we can get those dikaryotic cells. I'm going to work it, do it over here. We've seen these two ways before, so this isn't really new. One is, the n plus n result of plasmogamy grows to produce dikaryotic mycelium. I'll write n plus n mycelium. Right, and so that grows out throughout the leaf and creates new acea. So new acea can come from that. Dikaryotic mycelium grows out of new wounds primordia. But I've already said there are already acial primordia down there, and they're haploid. They also become dikaryotic. And here's where those holes come in. The male nucleus divides and migrates through the primary mycelium to the acial primordia. And these acial then primordia become and they form the acea. And here are the acea.
The spores that are in there are acial spores. And they are dikaryotic. And they are going to be shed. So there's a whole hell of a lot going on. Whoops. Ian, didn't mean to say that. In the barbary, but there is. A whole lot going on there. And if you have a better diagram, you do have a better diagram in your book, you can see here, here are dikaryotic mycelia growing down. The blue doesn't show up very well there. I will draw that in white. The dikaryotic mycelia. <coughs> growing out of those spermatogonia. Now, I'm never going to ask you to write this out in detail, right? But the thing you should know is what's going on here is we're getting plasmogamy occurring here, our monokaryotic haploid mycelia are being converted to dikaryotic mycelia and dikaryotic acial spores are being shed. So those are the important things. And a, you, haploid spores are coming in. The basidia spores are coming in. We are forming on the top these spermatogonia. You have to find a color that works. Spermatogonia, plasmogamy takes place here. And then by one of those different methods, we are going to get our dikaryotic mycelia growing down. And that's going to form the acia on the lower surface. And there we are on the lower surface of the leaf with the acial, acia is plural, acium is singular, and the, hop, the dikaryotic aceospore is being shed. Here they are on the lower surface of the leaf. We can tell it's the lower surface because we've got these very strong veins seen, but there are the acia. So you can see why they're called wounds. And that's not a bad infection, in fact. The acia look different in different varieties of this. Here they are again in a different version on the lower surface of the barberry leaf, shedding their dikaryotic spores. And here they are from the, in the microscope. And these are the acial spores. And they're dikaryotic. These have all stained, of course. I haven't been reminding you, but I'm assuming you know and these are all false colors. These are all stained. So you can see them better. Again, another version, look at there, there they are pushing off the epidermis of the leaf to form those acial spores. AC again. They are going to be shed then, and they are going to land on wheat. So there's the correct spelling of ACO spores. I've been spelling it ACO spores and ACO spores. So there's our dikaryotic ACO spores being shed. 
and they will grow if they land on wheat. So they're dispersed and they land on wheat. And now on wheat, in the early summer, this is taking place in the early summer now when they're dispersed from the barberry, and on wheat, they're gonna go through an a re a infection and reinfection cycle. So they first infect the wheat and they're producing <coughs> dicaryotic mycelium in the wheat. And then it's essentially asexual reproduction that's gonna take place all through the summer. So another kind of spore is gonna be produced on the wheat. Those spores are gonna be shed and they're gonna reinfect the wheat. The spores that are gonna be produced are called uridiniospores. Let me do it in a different color. <coughs> Yep, not, my spelling is not working this morning. Thank you. It's right, it's right there. Oh, you expect me to read now? <laughs> Uridinia spores. Okay, so they are dicaryotic spores, and they're going to reproduce more dicaryotic mycelium. So they're shed and reproduce more dicaryotic mycelium. So it's a kind of asexual reproduction, even though we're drawing it here within the life cycle. It, we could draw it as a cycle on the side. It would be a little difficult in this case, but we could draw it on a life, as a cycle on the side because this is going to be a major part of the life cycle of this organism as it reinfects wheat. Now the places where these things are shed are lesions. And those lesions are called uridinia. So the uridinia are the lesions, the openings, and they are shedding the uridinia spores. Uridinia means a blight, and it is very well named. The uridinia spores are red, and here they are in a very badly infected wheat field. And you can see that's all uridinia there on uridinia spores. So those are the red dicaryotic uridinia spores being shed there. So we can also see here, here is an infected an infected or a susceptible field. Let's try to find a color that works there. And this is a resistant variety. So the, and there is experimental work being done or has been done to produce resistant varieties. Of course, you have to have not just a resistant variety, but a yield has got to be as good as the susceptible variety when it's not infected. So you can see that infected one is really red. It's really bad. So there are stories, you know, of farmers when they would go out into their fields and they might be wearing white and that, and they walk across a field of this infected stuff and they emerge on the other side red. And you can see that those are uridinia spores. And just, this is an infected field being mowed under. And so that's that, that many spores that it can turn, make clouds of these things. So it's a huge problem. This is what it looks like in infected wheat. So this is healthy. I know it's got a red cast there. But that's what healthy wheat looks like. It's got that blush to it. And this is infected over here. Look at the size. This is about 50% of the size. of healthy wheat. That one I circled is less than 50%. That's maybe a third of the size. So you're losing a tremendous amount of production by the infection of this 
this organism on the wheat. Even though it does not affect the grain itself, it's not growing in the grain itself, it's just growing on the vegetative part of the plant. It saps the strength so much that the grains are produced at much smaller sizes. And so that's what we have taking place here, the uridinium, the uridiniospores, cycling all summer. <coughs> Through this reinfestation cycle. Now in the fall, these uridinia are transformed. The uridinia stopped producing uridinia spores and they start producing a new type of spore. I told you this was complex, but you were wondering where the teleospores were. So the uridinia transform into telia. The telia are just another kind of lesion, and they're producing, going to produce teliospores. The teliospores are black, so you can tell the difference. So these black spores start to be produced in the fall. New lesions can also form, so we can get both the transformation of the uridinia into telia, and we can get continued growth of the dicaryotic hyphae, but now it's going to produce new telia instead of new uridinia. The telia and the teliospores do not reinfect wheat. So this is now starting the sexual cycle of the plant. They're going to be involved in the other part of sexual reproduction, that is we're going to get karyogamy taking place in those teliospores. So we're going to have the dikaryotic teliospores undergoing karyogamy to produce our diploid teliospores. And you can see the difference in the diagram between those. Oops, sorry about that. Let's back up just a minute and look at the difference between these different types of spores. Here are the uridinia spores. This is, so this is a uridinia. So there are the uridinia spores. And the whole thing is the uridinium. It would be I-U-M as it's plural. Iridinium. Now, when we look closely at those spores, we can see we can see their structure, and I'm going to talk to you about the structure a little more, and then you'll see them in lab. But here, then, are the iridinia. with their iridinia spores and. All of this stuff, this is all the higher plant. That's the wheat. That's the leaf. And this is the stem. And you can see up here in the leaf, these cells here, they don't look very normal. These are normal cells down here. You can see clear cell walls, etc. Up here, it looks kind of messy. That's because we've got mycelium, dicaryotic mycelium, growing all throughout these regions and parasitizing the cells. <coughs> here where they see them in a little higher magnification, the uridinia spores. And if you look closely at them, they have that center constriction. And I'm not drawing it well.
but at that constriction, there is no cell wall. And see that here, perhaps, the best, and a nice one. So that's going to allow you to tell the difference between a uridinospore and a teleospore. And there's a uridinospore. Okay, on to the telia. Covered a lot of that already. <coughs> and so the teleospores are going to be either dikaryotic or diploid, and out of those diploid teleospores, we're going to have meiosis taking place. So here's karyogamy. And here is meiosis. We're going to produce our basidiospores. Here are the teleospores. Which color? And now you can see that in these teleospores, we still have the constriction, but there is a cell wall. And that purple did not show up at all. Let's switch to white. So there's a teleospore. You'll see those better in lab, and you can see the internal constriction on that. Again, you look closely, there's the cell wall. So this is a telium and teleospores. This, of course, is the epidermis of the plant. It's being parasized of the wheat. They look a little different in this case, but again, it is the tele and the teleospores. Let's see if green shows up here. <coughs> so there's a teleospore with that central cell wall. And here's perhaps the best picture. This was taken, this one was taken in lab, and you can see very clearly that central cell wall of the teleospores in many of these cells. So we're back to pretty much where we began. We're back to a process of meiosis, and that's producing then our basidiospores, our haploid basidiospores. And that's going to take place in the spring. Meiosis takes place in the spring, and these things are shed. And they begin the infection cycle again. So it's a huge problem. These are the areas when the infections were highest. These are the, these are the areas that are big wheat growing areas in the United States and where the infection was highest of these things. And how they got rid of it was, we've suggested it already, a major um, effort was made to eradicate the alternative host, eradicate the barberry. So get it, barberry out of the first fence rows. It's a relatively inexpensive way of doing it. There's no annual spraying and so on. Uh, pesticides, there's less of a health concern there. You just gotta remove those barberries. And in fact, in those areas, there was in the 50s and up until I believe the 70s, there was this um, National Rust Busters Club for the kids in schools could join. And so if you were, in school at that time, you might be involved in 4-H programs or things, and 
part of those programs would be for you to go out and find barberries that could be then pulled up and eradicated. So that was called the Rust Buster Club. And you can get a little Rust Buster medal for, for doing these things, activities. It's the, the programs were so successful that Barbary was pretty much eradicated from most of the farm areas and the, this pro program was discontinued. Now, it was never com it's never completely successful. These eradication efforts are never completely successful. They survived. There's still some barberries that are planted um, horticulturally and they survived in you know, creek bottoms and things down in thickets where even kids didn't all go that often. And so there were a few plants there and the bar... Um, Lucinia griminis has started to come back, but it's not a huge pest now. However, there is an active monitoring program by the U.S. government. And if you search for Pusinia griminis, you'll find their website, and they'll talk about the incidence of the occurrence of this pest in agriculture. So it's still out there, it still occurs, and it's still something that we have to be concerned about. But it, the important thing, well, a lot of important things here, but one of the important things is that we could get rid of it or get rid of a lot of it by simply disrupting the life cycle. And this turns out to be a really good um, way of controlling these kinds of complex organisms with multiple hosts, not just for agricultural plants, but also for human diseases. And so if you want to go on and read something about human diseases that have organisms that have complex life cycles, and we're also the solution was disrupting the life cycle. You can look up schistosomiasis, um, sleeping sickness, and it's a waterborne disease where the alternative host is a snail, human beings and snails. So it was a big problem, especially in Egypt when the Aswan Dam was first built. And I'm not gonna go into all the details there, but if you'd like to, you can go look up schistosomiasis or sleeping sickness. Same kind, same attempt, uh, a different method, but the same attempt to disrupt the life cycle, in this case, by killing the snails. Okay, let's try to draw the life cycle. We know we've got three parts to the life cycle now. We've got to have plasmogamy, <coughs> karyogamy, and meiosis. So that in the, on, between meiosis and plasmogamy, the organism is haploid. Between plasmogamy and karyogamy, it is dikaryotic. And between karyogamy and meiosis, I'm going to redraw that so I have a little more space there. It is diploid. And you know that there's not much going on. There's not many cells there. There's only one between karyogamy and meiosis. <coughs> Diploid. So we started before with the basidiospores, so let's do that again. Meiosis gives rise to our basidiospores. And those are going to produce then the primary mycelium. And that's of course going to be on the barberry. Primary mycelium gives us our spermogonium. Which produces the spermatia. And the pri other primary mycelium produces the receptive hyphae. Which are also part of, although not central to, they're kind of on the periphery of those spermogonia. The uniting, uniting of those two in plasmogamy produces then the dikaryotic hyphae or the dikaryotic mycelium. Now I'm going to follow the, your book and write the acea here as, well the acea and the, I'm going to write the uridinia here in this single line also, but of course we start with the acea 
and the acyl spores which are the dikaryotic spores shed from barberry. And at this place then we would switch from the barberry to the wheat. Aceospores would end up on the wheat. Why don't I switch colors here just to show you that. And on the wheat we get the uridinia. and the uridinia spores. So again, still dikaryotic, and now reinfecting the wheat, that cycle of reinfecting the wheat, the uridinia and the uridinia spores. In the fall, those uridinia spores, or those uridinia, are going to transform into telia and producing our dikaryotic, and I'm going to even write dikaryotic here just to remind us. Dikaryotic teliospores. And it's in those dikaryotic teliospores that karyogamy takes place. And that's all on the wheat. It doesn't look like very much here, but there's a lot going on. Karyogamy takes place. Now this can take place while the spores are still attached to the wheat, or it can <coughs> take place off the wheat after they're shed. That gives us our diploid teliospore. That's the only diploid cell, and that undergoes meiosis. So that's the life cycle as we would draw it out in our system.